And what better way of harvesting that energy from their environment so you don't have to go change their batteries, right? Welcome to Nano Matters, the podcast that explores examples of nanotechnology. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Here with me today is Nazanin Bazari Garb, the Harris Saunders Jr. Chair and Professor in the George W. Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech. She leads the Smart Materials Advanced Research and Technology, or SMART, laboratory. So, Nazanin, could you talk a little bit about what you mean by smart materials? Smart materials are materials that are responsive to their environment. In that sense, they should be able to understand some external stimulus. It could be the temperature, electric field, magnetic field, pH, and then respond to it with changes in their functionality. So in that sense, they should be smart. Usually they are functional materials, and often they are beyond functional, as in not only they change their functionality, but they are able to help us do something more with that change in functionality. So does that mean that they would not be applied perhaps as a sensor or an actuator? They are, absolutely. They are most of our sensors and actuators are really smart material. What we would like to have in the future are actually materials that are sensing directly and then actuating directly as a result of that sensing. And therefore they become really smart rather than only functional. So it's almost a wishful thinking (laughs) at this point. Many of our materials are already functional and many of them are used for sensors and actuators. And in fact, the beauty of them is that these materials work almost as a system. We don't have to design an electronics to, you know, get out the signal out of them. But the next step is, can we couple that sensing and that actuating capabilities to create something that directly senses and then responds to it. And then it's, it's really smart. So one of the applications I understand for these materials is what is sometimes called energy harvesting. And when we look at the internet of things and broad applications of many sensors that, that might be small or on flexible electronics, where do you see applications of energy harvesting to support these devices and how do they work? Many of our sensor systems need to be deployed in large numbers. And therefore, if they need to be deployed in large numbers, they will need to have a source of energy with them. And what better way of harvesting that energy from their environment so you don't have to go change their batteries, right? Think of (laughs) your, your smoke sensor in the house. Every few months, years, you will have to change that battery. Now imagine that that sensor had to be in a location that was really difficult to reach, but really important for you to have the information from, close to a volcano, in a a nuclear power plant, places where, where you don't want humans to go and do this exchange of energy source. This is where the energy harvesters come into play. You want to have a system that learns directly from its environment, and it is self-sufficient. So it can relay that information back to a reference or somebody that collects the information. Many of these technologies start to be there, but most often they require the systems to be chargeable. You have to plug them in. Your smart watch needs to be charged every few days. And we want to go far away from that. We want to have a system that is charging itself. Um, you, You remember the old mechanically charged watches, the one that you would switch your wrist? Exactly. Now think of it at a smaller scale and higher power and that it would be able to relay a lot more information. So combine the two and try to make energy independent sensors that communicate to us all of the information that we need and between each other. If you want to think of it, the next step of that are the cars. The self-driving cars relay heavily on the sensors and how to communicate to each other. The more you rely on the sensors, however, it means that the more energy they will need. So how can we make sure that those sensors are independent from other energy sources that we are using as fuel because otherwise we are making the car heavier and heavier with loading it with more and more fuel (laughs) or that we need to still charge them with electricity. So you can have a sensor in your um, tires that tells you about the pressure changes. You can have a sensor that is close to the fuel level. You can have a sensor that tells you the distance between the next car, but also with respect to the street margins. 
how would these devices be able to capture vibration or thermal gradients or other aspects of the environment in order to create the energy that's required? You can take piezoelectric materials or ferroelectric materials that have very large piezoelectric response. Imagine that yeah, these are materials that are responding to deformation or to apply the stress with creating charges. And then you collect these charges. Now make it into a membrane or on the freestanding cantilever, and then you amplify their mechanism to amplify the displacement or the vibration. And now every time that the car is vibrating, because it's running on the road, <laughs> you are harvesting, you are resulting in creation of charges on the surfaces of your material because that cantilever or that membrane is moving up and down. And then you can get to store them on a high density capacitor, for example, or you can charge the battery with it. Keep in mind that right now our nuclear power plants have to go down for up to a month for close inspection to happen on all of the different parts of it. And this has to happen every few years. If you did have a sensor that was embedded in all of the different parts that require monitoring and you continuously have a signal, you don't have to do that. To a large extent, you can have a continuously running power plant. And then only if you have a signal that starts to get to a, you know, orange zone, I'm not even saying red zone, then you shut down things and fix it. Could you talk a little bit about how nanotechnology plays a role in these applications? Do you recall the example of the mechanical watch that I made to you? We moved away from the gears and a spring that was getting loaded mechanically by vibrations, by moving a wrist, to quartz. And quartz was one of the first piezoelectric materials that we found that are changing stress into electricity. But we didn't use it for energy harvesting, really. We used it really for control of time. And then we realized that quartz maybe is not the best option. You have to start with a big one and it has to be a single crystal and it has to be cut properly. And there are materials that work and have even higher properties, but they don't need to be as big. And that's when we moved into complex oxides. And the complex oxides are awesome. What we have discovered over the years, the last decade or so, is that their very large functional responses really are born at the atomic scale. So we should be able to reduce them to the nanoscale without losing too much of their functionality. And that's, again, the beauty of it. The smaller you go, you're reducing the weight of the device, and you're often reducing even the power required for the device to make it work. Let's think of the car. The car, you need some fuel to run it, but of course, some fuel also to run the weight of the car around, right? So if you make the whole car lighter, you will need less fuel. That's the same concept even for microelectronics. If we do have systems that are making it smaller and smaller, you require less power, less voltage, less current. And therefore, if you have less demands on your batteries, maybe you can supplement some of that with your energy harvesting approaches. Well, I appreciate so much you taking the time to talk with us today. Do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners? I want to say appreciate science and support it because we are where we are because of science. 